Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see you all here this morning. You're very welcome to worship here at Whitehead Presbyterian Church. If you're new or you're just visiting with us this morning, let me especially welcome you. You're welcome to join us for tea and coffee after the service, have a chat and get to know us a bit more. My name is Adam and I'm the ministry coordinator here at Whitehead Presbyterian Church. As we come to worship this morning, uh, we turn to the Word of God in Revelation chapter 15, as we still our hearts before the Lord, looking at verses 3 and 4. Revelation 15 tells us, they held harps given to them by God, these are the angels, and sang the songs of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not, not fear you, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let me encourage you this morning as we come to praise God together, to drown out the noise of life with the praises of the only true and holy God, focusing yourself on the majesty of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus, who has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. We come to worship not because we are perfect, but because Jesus is worth it. Let me invite the choir to open our worship for us as they stand and sing, O oh, the mercy. to our announcements this morning and I have to confess the list isn't getting any shorter so stick with me here this morning. This is great stuff. I love that we have so many announcements, so much going on. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. So first um, and foremost we have Alan and Wendy's home group will be meeting this week in their home. That's on Thursday evening from 7.30 p.m. Um, the next one, um, something I announced last week, was we are on the lookout to recruit a youth and children's coordinator here within church to add to what we aspire to be. Um, as you can see right now, we don't have a lot of young families or kids running around the church, but we aspire to be a church that provides these services and that provides the ability for young families to come into our presence and see this as somewhere that they can make home. So part of that is realizing that I myself cannot do it all. And we do have the resources to recruit a youth and children's coordinator. So that will be a, a role that's 24 hours a week, um, helping to build our youth ministry, our children's ministry, something that Downshire is helping us to kick off right now. And we'll have an announcement about that as well. Is our youth ministry here, how we start to open up our halls and our facilities again to be used by young people in our community and we are a church that has a real heart for the young people in our community and we really want to invest in that so please stand with us in prayer um, as we seek the right person for this role 
Um, pray for applicants, pray for the process, and just pray that we are obedient to God's call to the right person for that role. It's a really exciting time that we have the opportunity to do this, to recruit and hire a youth and children's worker. Next, we have our next session meeting um, being held on Wednesday the 25th of October, and that will be held in the Minor Hall from 7.30 p.m. That's our next session meeting being held on Wednesday the 25th of October, 7.30 in the Minor Hall. Next, we have our, our harvest offering. Let me remind you that there's still time for you to give in your harvest offering envelopes right up until the end of the month. Um, and this year, we decided as a church that we would be dividing that harvest offering between the Leprosy Mission and Open Doors. And if you want more information on either of those charities or on the harvest offering, you can head to your contact magazine to find out more about that. But please consider giving to those two fantastic charities um, and really praying for all the work that they do um, around the world. Uh, if you don't have an envelope, you can still receive one of those. I would suggest you speak to Lex um, or the right in the vestibule. Thank you, Lex. Um, envelopes can still be grabbed out in the vestibule if you don't have them. And as I said, you can still give them your harvest offering right up until the end of October. Another really exciting um, announcement. We will be holding new members classes. That's for communicant members, um, new people that have been, become a part of our church over this last season. And we'll be holding these new members classes here in church on the 4th of November from 11 a.m. Now, for those of you who don't know what these courses or classes are, they are compulsory to become a member of the church, but they are really informal. They're really a really relaxed time to be able to have a cup of coffee. Um, myself and Nathan Duddy will be taking the classes and it's just a time to discover what it means to be a member, a full member of the Presbyterian Church here in Whitehead. And you'll have time to ask questions, to investigate all the different elements of what it means to be a member, why we do certain things the way we do. So if you're not currently a communicant member, let me tell you, I've already counted in my terrible imagination that there's at least seven of us here that are currently not communicant members. So let me encourage you, if you come to the class, it doesn't mean you have to go through with it, but it will at least give you a time to investigate and discover what this really means to become a full member of the Presbyterian Church. And it's a great time just to ask all those awkward questions that you need to ask to get a feel of, of what it means and it looks like. So let me encourage you, that's Saturday the 4th of November here at church from 11 a.m. Our new communicant classes. Um, and then we have one more, I believe, announcement, but I'm going to invite Hannah up to share that one with us. Thanks. Good morning, my name is Hannah Cree and I'm the Youth Coordinator at Downshire. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm here this morning as Adam's wife, but also with an announcement as I've been working very closely with the youth leaders in the area. We have had a few events so far before, but between Bally Carey and Ida McGee and ourselves. Uh, we've had the men's event, a women's event and a girls event for secondary school aged girls. This Friday, which is the 20th of October, um, is a mixed event for both boys and girls in secondary school and it'll be here in Whitehead. Rumour has it we have a Belfast giant uh, coming to speak to us with his testimony and there'll be hot dogs, some games, a gaming console, um, gaming stations and craft. So if you know anyone who's secondary school aged, please invite them along. Or if you want to come and be part of that evening, it would be great to have some hands on deck, just welcoming the kids in, uh, maybe manning some of those stations or helping prepare some food. If you would like to come and help, please speak to myself or Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. As we come to continue our worship here this morning, let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, first of all, we just thank you. We give you all the glory for the work that you are doing here in our midst. Lord, we thank you for all the activities, Lord, all these announcements, Father, of, of just the life 
that is going on here. And Father, we just give you all the glory and all the praise for that, Lord. We thank you for how you are working in us and through us. And we just pray that you continue to do that, Lord. And this morning, as we gather here, Lord, we come to give you all the glory. Lord, we come to worship you, to praise you, Lord, to set aside our, our self, Lord, and to focus solely on you as the king of our lives, Lord, as the saviour of our souls. Father, we love you and we come here this morning to magnify the name of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, be at work amongst us, rest upon us, lead us and guide us in our praise and worship. Because we are here only because of you. Lord, we are here only because of your love, your grace, your mercy that you so freely gave us in the person of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen. Let us all stand to worship together as we stand and sing, Lord, I come before your throne. Let us stand and praise God together. <laughs> Continue to serve and worship the Lord with our offering.
Let us pray and give thanks. Heavenly Father, Lord, we present these gifts to you, Lord, our offering. Lord, our offering out of your provision. Lord, our offering out of our own. Father, an offering way too small compared to the gift that you give us in Jesus, but an offering nonetheless that signifies our submission to you, our submission to your mission to go out into the four corners of this earth, Lord, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, proclaiming that God is good, proclaiming the resurrection and the life. Father, we offer these gifts to you, dedicated to your name, to your mission, dedicated to bringing you glory and magnifying the name of Jesus. We lay them now at your feet, in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Let us stand together once again as we praise God, saying, Thank you for saving me. Let us stand and sing together.
now come to our prayers of intercession and before we come to pray together I want to first of all just say what a tough time this is to, to pray for the world around us, how difficult it is to, to come up with the, the words, you know, the right words to align ourselves with God's will because ultimately that's what prayer is. When we pray together we're aligning ourselves not to our will or to our needs but to God's will, submitting ourselves to his guidance for our lives. And at this time, as I came to think about what we can pray in mind of the current conflict in the Middle East, it becomes difficult. And really my prayer this morning, as you'll see in a second, is purely focused on the most important thing in all of this, which is people. People, humanity, and the humans and the lives that are involved in all sides. So if you wanted or hoped that we had a specific prayer for one side or the other, that's not my goal. As the church, we stand on the side of people. We stand on the side of humanity, of love, of respect. So as we come here to pray together for what is going on, and my only prayer this morning in our prayers and intercessions for that conflict, we pray against war, we pray for peace, and we pray for the love and respect of every single human as God would have us do, and as Jesus modeled for us here when he was on earth with us. So with that in mind, let us come and join together in prayers for the world around us. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is so difficult to find the words to say. So Holy Spirit, as we pray, Lord, both verbally and, and in our hearts and minds in silence. Holy Spirit, take these human words, these often broken human words, Lord, and, and make them pure and clean before the Father. Lord, we pray earnestly that love and peace will prevail in all countries, in all parts of the world. Father, but today we come with broken hearts, devastated for the people, caught up in the current conflict in the Middle East. Lord, we ask for God's protection. We ask for your protection for the innocent. Lord, for civilians, for women, children, elderly, the sick. Protect them, Lord, on all sides. Heavenly Father, we pray that the war will end quickly. And in the meantime, Lord, that you will meet all needs, especially at that time. Especially at this time, Lord. We pray that your church will be a light in the middle of this total darkness, reflecting the light and love of Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray for the many, many organizations, the many missionaries and charities that currently work within Gaza and Israel and the rest of the Middle East. Lord, we pray for protection for them. Give them your peace and your comfort as they continue to work in these horrible circumstances. Keep them safe. And for those desiring passage home or passage out, Lord, we, we pray that you provide a way. For those who decide to stay, to work and serve others for the glory of Christ, Holy Spirit, continue to work through them to shine the light of Jesus in an area that is so significant to the ministry of Christ while he was on earth and in the history of our own faith. Heavenly Father, we pray for an end to all violence, to all injustice. Lord, we pray against the plight of humanity that we wage on each other. We ask that the church might be a beacon of hope for the people around them, or through their testimony and the words and actions. Lord. Lord God, comfort those who have lost loved ones. 
or who are waiting to hear about missing family and friends, show to them your peace and mercy. Comfort them with your goodness and kindness, Lord. Lord, we pray for the rest of the international community where it seems like there's not a single person who has not got themselves involved on one side or the other. Lord, we pray for our own government. Lord, we pray that our involvement in this would be in working towards everlasting peace. Lord, I pray that our involvement in this is in working towards the goodness of those who live normal lives like me and the rest of us. I pray that our part in this will be one led by you. Father, we also continue to lift up our prayers against all kinds of injustice and war, against all kinds of cruelty that man can subject to a fellow human to. Lord, forgive us when we sit back and allow injustice and darkness to will. Lord, let us not forget about the current conflict in Ukraine and Russia, Lord, and the countless other ignored conflicts around the world. You, Jesus, are the only answer to true peace and reconciliation. You, Jesus, are the only way truth and the life we trust in you so lord help us as the church not just here in whitehead but all over the world globally help us in this time to never cease in pray lord give us the faith to know that prayer can move mountains lord give us the comfort to understand that prayer is not in action but that prayer is the very action that you have called us to when any storm brews. Lord, we run to you. We run to you and we cling to you. We lift all those suffering, all those bereaved, missing, injured and displaced, we lift them up to you. Lord, let your love reign above all else. Let your love and peace reign above everything. Lord, we pray all these things in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We now come to our reading for this morning. And this morning's reading, as we continue on in our series in Matthew, will be taken from Matthew chapter 12 we'll be reading from verses 1 to 14 so again as you make your way there in your bible that is matthew chapter 12 beginning at verse 1 to verse 14. this is the word of god at that time jesus went through the grain fields on the sabbath his disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He, Jesus, answered, Haven't you read what David did when he, when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you have known what these words mean, I desire mercy not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into 
their synagogue, and the man with the shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Amen. Let us stand together once again to praise God, singing living.
wasn't for the excitement of technology not working, what else would we do? So we continue on in our series within Matthew, picking up a, a couple of chapters on from where we last studied together. And over these last number of weeks, these first couple of weeks in our study, we've been intently looking at the character of Jesus, looking at this King, our King and his coming Kingdom of Heaven, taking our lessons from his life and his ministry. We've looked at the call for repentance at this coming Kingdom. We've looked at the King of this Kingdom, Jesus, how he was teacher, how he was healer, cleanser, and ultimately last week, how he is the true author of all creation, God himself. And we've been building this picture of the true humanity of Jesus, yet also bearing in mind the full divinity of God in the flesh, that this is truly God with us, Emmanuel. Hopefully by now we're starting to build up this incredible picture of the character of Jesus in our minds and as I said, continually this incredible King who has came to us to live with us and as us, bringing about his kingdom on earth. And now we come to this morning's reading, another well-known story and a slight change in perspective from the narrative of Matthew so far. We're painted what seems to be this quite lovely scene with Jesus and the disciples walking together through these grain fields on a Sabbath day. And while they're on their way, they become hungry and they start to pick the grain off its stalks of this field and eat it. Yet in the background of this lovely image, someone is keeping a very close eye. You see, as we have much spent much time Focusing on the, the wonders of Jesus, his teaching, the miracles, his growing following, and his incredible earthly ministry. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law have been doing exactly the same as we have. Keeping an eye, taking real notice of this new Jewish teacher and with an ever-growing band of followers. And specifically, we see the start in chapter 9, right after where we last looked at Jesus calming the storm. We see one of his first real encounters in this gospel with the Pharisees. Jesus healed a paralyzed man, telling him to take heart. His sins were forgiven, to which the teachers of the law claimed that Jesus was blaspheming. Then again, in the same chapter, the Pharisees begin asking the disciples why their teacher, Jesus, eats with tax collectors and sinners. And now we find ourselves here. And when we think about it, it's actually a rather funny encounter. Because if you really stop to imagine the situation, these Pharisees, now only aren't just bumping into Jesus in his path and ministry, but they are literally following them around, following them and following Jesus and his disciples everywhere. So much so that they are right in this field on a Sabbath morning with Jesus, watching, waiting, deliberating, probably asking themselves the exact same question the disciples did on that boat that we looked at last week. What kind of man is this? Yet for the Pharisees, there were very different motives. So here we see Pharisees snooping around after Jesus and they think, ah, we've got him. We've caught him, finally. They scurry over to Jesus, exclaiming, what your disciples are doing is unlawful. Now what's important here is that the unlawful part about all this isn't the action of eating grain from someone else's field. That's not the problem, because Jewish farmers were told that when it came to harvest, they were only allowed to go through the field once. They were only allowed to lift their crops once, and anything else that fell to the way wayside or anything else that was missed was left. And this whole idea in the Jewish custom was a law of mercy. It was a law that allowed the poor to come along and lift anything else that was left, anything that wasn't collected in that first go round in the harvest. 
So the act itself, not like in our community where if you went and started lifting tomatoes from somebody's field, you'd get in trouble. It wasn't stealing. What they were doing was lawful. The real problem was what? The real problem was it was the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath. And the, for the Pharisees, the Sabbath was obviously to be kept holy. You were to refrain from work, the day of rest, and the Jews were to remember the Sabbath. God had set this day of rest, Sabbath, Shabbat, as a sign of the covenant that they had with their God. Of course, one of the problems here is that the Pharisees and the Jewish lawmakers took this command to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And they blew it out of all proportion. They took it and they piled regulation upon regulation onto this command. And it literally became ridiculous. It became so ridiculous, in fact, that they made so many regulations to manage the Sabbath that they had to make many regulations and loopholes to get around the rules of Sabbath. Ancient rabbis taught on the Sabbath a man could not carry something with his right or his left hand across his chest or on his shoulders. But he could carry something on the back of his hand. Can you imagine doing your shopping that way? He could carry something with his foot, with his elbow. He could carry it on his ear, on his hair, on the hem of his shirt, or in his shoe or sandal. So not only had they piled regulation upon regulation onto the Sabbath, they had actually then went, oh, hold on a minute. What if we need to do X, Y, and Z? And they created regulation and regulation to get around the regulation that they put in place to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. On the Sabbath, you were forbidden to tie a knot. Except if you were a woman, you could tie a knot in your girdle. So if a bucket of water had to be raised from a well, you couldn't tie a knot and a rope to the bucket, but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket to use as a rope to lift a water out. You get the picture. It got mad. They had taken God's command to rest, to remember the Sabbath as a holy day, and they created this system of legalism. Legalism to manage what? People to manage the people. And now we could spend so much time focusing on the Sabbath, focusing on what it means for us today, what we each individually believe about Sabbath. But I don't really want to do that this morning. And maybe some of you might want me to, maybe the Sabbath has been an issue for you or your understanding of Sabbath has come from a certain way that you grew up. But really what I'm saying is that there are so many things we could discuss about Sabbath, but I don't want to head in that direction this morning. And here's why. Even though the Pharisees are coming to Jesus and trying to make the Sabbath the issue here, it's not the issue. The Sabbath in this story isn't the issue. And we've heard it taught this way so many times that this story is about the Sabbath. It's about how we look at the Sabbath today. But the Sabbath is not the issue here, not one bit. Even though the Pharisees are coming along and trying to accuse Jesus and his disciples of breaking the law, not respecting the Sabbath, it's just not true. Now don't get me wrong, the Pharisees would have loved nothing more than to be able to charge Jesus and his disciples with the number of laws they had broken. They could have accused them of four broken laws in one mouthful. They could have accused them of reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing food on the Sabbath. A legalist's dream. A legalist's dream. And for a legalist, there is nothing more than just following those rules and regulations. Nothing greater than basing your own spirituality on your ability to keep the laws and regulations. Nothing more important than the ability to judge others' spirituality on their ability to keep the rules and regulations. The problem with legalism 
is that it leaves no room, no room for people, for humanity. It makes no room for caring for others. It leaves no room for the needs of others. And that's the point Jesus goes on to make. And that's the point I feel God is wanting to show through this story. Because you see, it's only the Pharisees that try to make this about the Sabbath. And when we do the same, when we use this story to say this is about the Sabbath, the only people claiming that here are the Pharisees. Jesus says no. Jesus says that's not the point here. So Jesus starts to try to explain to the Pharisees. Starts to try to explain with three quite simple stories all in this one kind of narrative. And the first example Jesus presents is simple. Illustrated by David's experience with the priests and the showbread from 1 Samuel 21. And this incident with David is a great example. First of all, because it was a case of eating. Second of all, we believe it most likely happened on the Sabbath when we look at 1 Samuel 21.6. And also, it concerned not only David, but also his followers. And essentially what Jesus is saying in this example is that the context of David's taking the showbread in 1 Samuel 21 shows that David was justified in doing so. Now, if David had eaten the holy bread out of profanity or bravado, it might have been an offence, maybe. But to do so in urgent need was not a crime. It was not breaking the law. Jesus is reminding the Pharisees that human need is more important than observing ceremonial rituals and rules. Jesus goes on. Jews, the priests in the temple themselves, breaking these strict Jewish laws. He's essentially pointing out, wait, your own priests work the Sabbath. Your own priests on the Sabbath lift the sacrifice. They clean the altar. They sprinkle the blood. They prepare the food. Yet you're happy with those guys working on the Sabbath. Jesus is building this picture. He said, hold, hold on a minute. Look at these things. Look at these things here. I'm going to show you a past example of one of the most venerated men in all of Israelite history. Explain that to me. And then he's going to lift the current example, a blatant law breaking by your own priests. They don't follow these rules. Jesus is saying, guys, this doesn't add up. This doesn't add up. You're missing the point. Why in these cases is this law Overlooked. Why? Well, Jesus, I believe, hits the nail on the head explicitly. He lays this all bare with this one explanation. Jesus points to Hosea. He points to Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, and quotes God himself. He says to the Pharisees, If you understood what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice then maybe you get it. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus is saying, human need, real human need, trumps the regulations. These regulations that they have piled on, these beautiful commands by God, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He's saying human need takes priority. He's not saying the rules are stupid or bad or to be thrown out. He's not even telling the Pharisees to get rid of those rules. But what he's saying is human need trumps these regulations. Jesus is saying being merciful to one another is far more important than following any of your ceremonial rituals and rules. Mercy wins. Mercy wins. Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, you should know this. You should know this. Haven't you read? Haven't you seen? Haven't you understood? This is not new. 
This isn't some new concept of, God, of a God that desires mercy over sacrifice. This isn't something brand new. I'm not creating this. But these guys were all about sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice, rules and regulations. And this misunderstanding, unfortunately, of the nature of God isn't actually that foreign to us today. We can sit back and look at the Pharisees and think, boy, did they get this so wrong. But we, and when I say we, I mean the body of Christ, have continually fallen victim of doing the exact same. Elevating sacrifice, maybe not literal sacrifice, but rituals and regulations over and above mercy. And unfortunately, a great deal of this thinking, a great deal of this way of looking at our faith comes from just a real bad theology on who the Trinity is, on who God is. We can often have these ideas that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are somehow at a cosmic loggerhead. Thinking that, sure, the Father is wrath. He's not mercy. We think Jesus is the mercy part. That Jesus is somehow trying to convince God to show mercy, standing in the way of his wrath towards us. And yes, we have that on the cross. But we have this terrible thought that there's this difference in opinion or mission within the Trinity. That mercy is only the job of Jesus, that the Father's job is wrath and judgment. And that just simply isn't true. That is a poor theology. Because the nature of God is one. There's no disagreement within the Trinity. Jesus tells us this himself time and time again. John 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. John 5, 19, even better, says, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. There's no disagreement within the Godhead. There's no split in the Trinity. We have one God and three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And let me encourage you, they are not arguing. As much as we read about God's wrath over the centuries, we can also read about the wrath of Jesus in his 30 years in the New Testament. It's there. We see it as he unleashes his zeal on those who dare to turn his father's house into a marketplace. We all know that one well. He's angry with the Pharisees who are about to plot his death, pained by the hardness of their hearts. He's angry with his own disciples standing in the way of children. So we can see those characteristics of God and Jesus. But yet at the same time, we read about the mercy of God continually throughout the Old Testament, time and time again. Micah 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight, delight to show mercy. God delights to show mercy. Delights to. And that's what Jesus is saying in this story. Jesus came to show us the character of God in human flesh. He and the Father are one. Don't get mixed up in that. All of the divinity of God establishing that his kingdom this kingdom of heaven is one of mercy. This is not a kingdom of extracting every last drop of blood out of the sacrifice, religion, or regulations and rituals. This isn't a kingdom of separation. No, God is one. Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And they delight to show mercy. Mercy. can't allow ourselves to get caught up in thinking that there is some kind of separation here. The only evidence we have 
points us boldly towards the unity of love, grace, and mercy of God. Again, we are told in Micah this time, going back a chapter, verse chapter six, verse eight. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God has shown us what is good. He has shown us what is good. And just so we're all on the same page, by the way, mercy, to define it so we all understand, mercy is compassion. Mercy is forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within your total and right power to punish, to be annoyed at, to be angry at, to not forgive. Mercy is when you have the right to offer some type of punishment or the power to punish, but yet you choose compassion. You choose forgiveness. The problem is that we forget this all too often. And it never ends up good for us as a church when we allow ourselves to forget that we have a God of mercy. Because in and of ourselves, we just become like these Pharisees. We just become morality police, trying to control and judge everything for God. We need to realize when we we need to realize we have no need to. We've no need to control and judge for God. We've got no need to make sure our rules and regulations are observed by everyone else. Because God will judge. I believe that. I wholeheartedly believe that. But I don't sit on the judgment seat. Neither now nor in heaven in the future. And any thought at any point that I am the judge or that you are the judge is purely legalistic. Purely legalistic. In fact, it's probably arrogant and near blasphemous to say, well, I deserve to sit in that seat. No, that's God's seat. That's not your seat. It's not my seat. I don't sit in that seat. I don't have the right to. I don't have the ability to. I don't have the ability to carry the weight that that, that takes on us. No, we are called to show mercy, love, and compassion, even for those who walk outside of our ways, even to those who scorn our faith. Mercy, mercy. Why? Well, because Titus chapter 3, 4, and 5 tells us that the only reason that any of us are here this morning, the only reason any of us are sitting here, the only reason that we can have confidence in our Savior is mercy. Titus 3, 4 and 5 tells us, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Why? Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. You see, the idea of righteousness, Getting us anywhere is flawed. Nothing you did brought you here today. No act of goodness or love. No, it was only because of mercy. And because we are the recipients of mercy, we then in turn should be givers of mercy, living a life of mercy. God will deal with the things that need judged. Don't get me wrong. But you don't need to worry about those. The Holy Spirit will work in and convict the hearts of people. I have every faith in that. Those who truly seek Christ will find that. But none of it's our job. None of it. Matthew finishes this portion of scripture with the story of Jesus yet again showing mercy and love to a man in the synagogue with a shriveled hand. And in his explanation to the Pharisees, he talks about how they would save their sheep if it fell into a pit on the Sabbath. We all understand the point Jesus is making. But in verse 12, Jesus says, How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good 
on the Sabbath. Notice Jesus didn't say, how good, how much more valuable is a Christian? How much more valuable is a good person? Jesus didn't say, a person who follows our way of life is valuable. No, he says, how much more valuable is a person? Full stop. It was this healing, it was this rhetoric from Jesus that that set the Pharisees on a craze, on on a plot of killing Jesus. It was the Lord's priority to show mercy and love that caused the Pharisees to want to see him dead. Why? Because they loved ritual. They loved regulation. They loved Sacrifice, they loved their custom, their own rules and regulations far more than they loved people. They would rather see someone starve on the Sabbath than let them eat the heads of grain. They would rather watch someone suffer in pain than see them healed and restored. They would rather see people judged than show mercy. Rather than loved as a valuable person. And this morning, as we close, I want to ask you this. Are you forgiving people the same way as you have been forgiven? Are you showing mercy in the same way that you have been shown mercy? Seriously. Are we, as Colossians 3 tells us, bearing with one another's weaknesses? Are we doing a good job at showing the world that this kingdom and this king are one of mercy and love? Are we doing a good job of that? We don't get me wrong, I know there will be judgment. I'll say it time and time again as the caveat. I know there will be judgment, but I also know it's not my job. Yes, I hope to see people become more and more like Jesus, but I trust the Holy Spirit will do that work for them. Amen through them. I can't change people. You can't change people. Judgment certainly won't change people. We can only show them who the king of this kingdom really is. We will get plenty of practice in this arena. Plenty of practice in this arena of being a Christian. We have plenty of opportunities day by day to show (coughs) mercy or to not show mercy. Will we choose mercy? Or will we stand like the Pharisees, loving ritual, ceremony, regulation? Because for me, I want to trust the Holy Spirit to work through the love and mercy you can show to those around us. Because that's who Jesus is. That's who I want to become more and more like with each passing day, and I hope, I hope and pray you do too. Let us pray together. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. Lord, for your guidance. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here with us now. Lord, teach us, teach us, what it is to show true love and mercy to those around us. Lord, to present your kingdom as a kingdom of love and mercy to those around us, to present you, Father, through the person of Jesus as true love and mercy, Lord. Lord, help us never to choose to sit in that judgment seat. Lord, help us to trust that you know what's best for each of us. Holy Spirit, that you will work in and through each of us, that you will convict, that you will lead. Heavenly Father, that you will judge, but that here, now, you've asked us to go out and show the world that yours is a kingdom of love and mercy. Lord, we thank you for how you've taught us. We thank you for how you lead us. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let me invite the choir back up. And before we close with the benediction this morning, let us stand together and sing God of grace. Let us stand and sing together.
share the benediction together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Amen.